There are no brakes on the true crime freight train and the series monster. The Jeffrey Dahmer story has proven that. Sporting the highest initial viewing numbers of any Netflix series ever, Monster, the Jeffrey Dahmer story, solidifies the fascination with true crime and serial killers in the public imagination. By telling the story over the course of 10 episodes allows the series to do a deeper dive into the people affected and the series of missteps that meant Dahmer evaded capture for over 10 years. Let's look under the hood of Netflix's popular new entry. Part of the fascination with serial killers is their meticulous routines and methods to lure people into a vulnerable place to do the horrible things that they do. One of Dahmer's moves was to invite the person he was stalking over to watch a movie while he roofies their drink. One of his go-tos, perhaps unsurprisingly, was Exorcist 3. Maybe not everyone's favorite entry into the Exorcist series, but he's not doing a film festival here. In Exorcist 3, Ken Lerner plays Dr. Friedman. Ken Lerner also makes an appearance at the end of the series, as real estate developer Joe Zibler, who, upon learning that Dahmer's possessions were going to be auctioned off, buys them all himself for a little over $400,000, loaded them into a dump truck, and crushed and buried every last thing so that people wouldn't have trophies of Dahmer, elevating his status. Evan Peters' portrayal of the nearly monotone Dahmer is a far cry from his Quicksilver character in the X-Men franchise and a brief tease in the MCU via dueling witchcraft in WandaVision. However, if you're a fan of Ryan Murphy shows, then this portrayal isn't quite as surprising. In American Horror Story, Peters plays James March, who designs a hotel that has a lot of hidden passageways and hideaways to support his serial killing habit. He later ends up haunting the place because why not? To complete the connection, in the episode Devil's Night, Peter's James March ghost gives Dahmer and John Wayne Gacy tips of the trade. At this point, it's hard to do a movie that does not have someone somewhere in the cast that has not appeared in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. The content machine is hungry for talent, let me tell you. While there are not as many Jeffrey Dahmer movies as there are MCU movies, there are still a lot of portrayals of Jeffrey Dahmer. Evan Peters, as mentioned, has appeared in both of the X-Men franchise and the Marvel Cinematic Universe as Quicksilver. In 2002, before he was Hawkeye, before even he was hurting lockers or whatever that title means, Jeremy Renner played the Michigan serial killer in the movie Dahmer. The series employs non-linear storytelling to provide a lens on Jeffrey Dahmer's progression as a serial killer. Even moments that we've already seen, like Dahmer's arrest, will get a replay as seen by a different character. Episode 3, named Doing a Dahmer, was the episode that took a peek into when he first decides to kill someone. His first intended target is a jogger he had spotted on his normal route. Dahmer decides to lay in wait with a baseball bat, only to find himself not up to chasing a regular runner. This is a slightly fudged real-life moment where he laid in wait to attack the jogger, but they simply didn't show that day, so he was forced to look elsewhere to get his start. Dahmer was clear that he felt he deserved the death penalty, but Wisconsin had abolished the death penalty all the way back in the 19th century. So when he was found guilty of 16 murders, he received 16 consecutive life sentences. Turns out that in cases where parole is possible, the consecutive life sentences lengthen the time the prisoner needs to serve before being eligible for parole. In cases where parole is not an option, if one guilty verdict is overturned, there are still 15 valid life sentences. He would get a de facto death sentence, however, when fellow inmate Christopher Scarver took a time when they were alone to beat Dahmer with a dumbbell bar. In the show, Scarver is given several available reasons, but in a 2015 interview with the New York Post, he said that the motive was Dahmer's lack of respect and seriousness of his situation. This is revealed in the first conflict between Scarver and Dahmer. Later, he's shown the nature of Dahmer's crimes, and that is given as the reason for attacking Dahmer. Finally, he's seen praying for guidance and presents himself at the time as a vessel of God, something that would go into his defense initially in the hopes of getting institutionalized versus incarcerated. The show didn't come down on one side or another, so they demonstrated all of them. There have been so many movies about Dahmer or things where Dahmer was a character that the question of why this one is worth asking. 
The answer is, the longer format gave a better chance to portray the victims as people and not just victims on a list, and to highlight how prejudices led to multiple missed opportunities to stop Dahmer earlier. Perhaps the most frustrating is the incident where 14-year-old Connor Axenthism phone escaped Dahmer, only for officers Balserzak and Gabrish to take him back to Dahmer, who convinced them that he was his 19-year-old boyfriend who had a few too many, while Glenda Cleveland was not there, just her daughter and niece. Other details were word for word, including Officer Balserzak telling his dispatch that he needed a good delousing. As in the show, both officers were suspended and later reinstated in 1994. The show juxtaposes Cleveland receiving a Citizen's Award and the two officers getting an Officer of the Year Award. That did not happen. They were reinstated and given back pay and had long careers afterwards. The name Dahmer, Monster, the Jeffrey Dahmer story might seem like an awkward mouthful, and you are right. The show is the sixth major project covering Jeffrey Dahmer, including Jeremy Renner's 2002 Dahmer. Just prior to release, the show had also been called Dahmer, but the monster, the Jeffrey Dahmer story was added so it wouldn't be confused with the 2002 movie. One of the reoccurring themes of this show is how often Dahmer could have been stopped, but wasn't either through an abundance of benefit of the doubt or an abundance of doubt of what the witnesses are telling them. After Dahmer's year in jail for sexual assault, he was assigned a parole officer in Donna Chester. Her logs indicated that they met relatively regularly twice a month, including a meeting that took place in Dahmer's apartment a week before his last kill. Chester became a key witness to the further trials, including a lawsuit against the city of Milwaukee with her well-kept logs. She needed that kind of organization because at the time, she had 121 cases on her docket. While Dahmer's father features throughout the telling of his story, the eighth episode focuses on the father through the lens of his book, A Father's Story. Some of the portrayals are lifted from the book, including Lionel's insistence that the cocktail of medications his wife was taking during the pregnancy contributed to Jeffrey's damage. The shocking revelation to his second wife is that Lionel had the same murderous thoughts and urge to control others as Jeffrey, and lamented that he was never able to make the connection between his own urges and those of his serial killer son. The show suggests that all of the victims sued for the profits of the book, but in reality it was only two. But the show was accurate in that the book didn't really sell. One of the central characters in the series is Glenda Cleveland, the highly suspicious neighbor who continuously contacts law enforcement about her suspicions about Jeffrey Dahmer, only to have her concerns dismissed by an indifferent Milwaukee police force. For the episode that focuses on Cleveland's efforts to get literally anyone to listen to her is titled Cassandra. Cassandra is a figure from Greek mythology who was a priestess who had the power to see the future but could not get anyone to believe her or even to listen to her. While Glenda was a real person who made several reports about Dahmer, her portrayal is actually a hybrid of Cleveland and a woman named Pamela Bass. Bass was the actual neighbor of Dahmer who, despite the smell and sounds, didn't actually suspect Dahmer of much and got along with him. Glenda Cleveland actually lived in a companion building for the apartment complex, but was still able to observe the comings and goings of her serial killer neighbor. One of the more disturbing sequences in the show is when Dahmer tries to feed Cleveland a mystery meat sandwich, which she resists. In the IFC film, The Jeffrey Dahmer Story, Pamela Bass notes that Dahmer would give out things to people on his floor, including meat. Put in the light of Dahmer's actions, Bass said that she almost certainly ate human body parts. We'll just uh, give you a moment there, because because we need one. And um, okay, we will move on. In addition to focusing on the missed opportunities Milwaukee's law enforcement had with numerous police contacts, the series also provides some focus on the strange phenomenon of turning serial killers into folk heroes, including souvenir hunters and a comic book that featured Dahmer as the central character, all of which are completely true. What's also true is the people who wrote into Dahmer would also include money to buy items through the prison store. However, the show downplayed how far that had gotten. Overall, he received more than $12,000 with just shy of six grand coming from one source. 
In the aftermath of Dahmer's arrest, the series also focuses on the negative attention that the families of the victims received. The Synthes and Phone family continually received phone calls focusing on their immigrant status. It's believed, but never proven, that it was police officers upset over the suspension of the two officers who gave their child back to Dahmer, but they weren't the only ones who got strange calls. Errol Lindsay's sister, Rita, also received calls saying, you don't know me, I'm up here with Jeffrey Dahmer. Don't worry, we will take care of it. We also see Dahmer call the family to tell them that they can stop looking for their lost child. This was actually a regular thing that Dahmer would do for all of his victims. One of the more emotional sequences came when the families of Dahmer's victims got to make their statements before sentencing. Those statements were actually taken from the court records, including Rita Isbell diving across the table trying to get at Dahmer. Being the younger brother can be tough as they tend to feel like they're forever in the shadow of their older brother. And when your older brother casts as big a shadow as one of the most notorious serial killers in history, that's a shadow that you cannot wait to get out of. While David Dahmer was barely present in this series, in real life, after the exploits of his brother came out, David Dahmer disappeared altogether, at least in the legal sense. David Dahmer changed his name and moved far away to escape the unfortunate legacy left by his brother. Towards the end of the series, there becomes the question of what to do with Jeffrey Dahmer's brain. One can quibble about the origin of the term serial killer, but in its modern usage and fascination, it started in the mid-70s with the first time it showed up in newsprint in 1981. The modern usage is attributed to Robert Ressler. The character Bill Tench in the series Mindhunter is based on Ressler. By the time that Dahmer was caught, the FBI had only been tracking this kind of thing for a little over a decade, and there really aren't that many serial killers, so they were taking any chance that they could get to learn about what goes into being a serial killer. That meant that they had interest in studying Dahmer's brain. His father objected, citing his written request to be cremated. Lionel won, and the brain was cremated as well. But despite the mom's objections, before Joyce Dahmer died, she also left a handwritten note requesting to be cremated. In episode 10, there was a convergence of events that seems like the ultimate embodiment of symbolic filmmaking. As Dahmer is baptized, John Wayne Gacy is executed. And if that were not enough, there's a nice pregnant with symbolism solar eclipse. See, the thing is, all of this really did happen at once. Sometimes things just line up. Dahmer begins his adventure as a predator when he discovers the bathhouse, one of the few spaces gay men can express themselves without judgment, or more importantly, danger. That is, until Jeffrey Dahmer came to play. It was there that he began to try out roofies. In the show, after two incidents, he's instantly banned from the bathhouse. The manager of Club Bath Milwaukee received between four to six instances of men being drugged and assaulted by Dahmer, but given the climate surrounding homosexuality at the time, none of the men were willing to press charges. Paramedics had to be called on one of Dahmer's targets who would spend 10 days unconscious. Keeping with the pattern, even though police interviewed Dahmer, they decided nothing serious enough had happened. With so many depictions of Dahmer, it is a fair question to ask. Why one more? Before Peters took the role, he had a principle that guided the performance and the writing. They did not want to foster empathy or a connection between Dahmer and the audience, saying, quote, as an audience, you're not really sympathizing with him. You're not really getting into his plight. You're sort of watching it, you know, from the outside, end quote. The non-linear format of the show shows the different stages of his evolution from the point of view of victims or survivors. With that, Peters and show creator Ryan Murphy could focus the empathy towards his victims and the people around him. Reasons are given for Dahmer's actions without any verification or insight, leaving his motivations as much of a mystery as they are in real life. There's a sequence in the series after Dahmer gets a job as a phlebotomist. After a day at work, he sneaks home three bags of blood and drinks them in ecstasy. Meant to be a prelude to his people eating ways. The reality is that Dahmer said that he tried a vial of blood and ended up spitting it out immediately. Dahmer's large square glasses were an identifying element of his look. However, most courtroom photos have Dahmer not wearing glasses at all. In the show, Dahmer keeps the glasses on the entire time. 
but the real Dahmer didn't want to deal with seeing the faces of the people accusing him, so he took off his eyewear. The series opens big by opening at the end of Dahmer's serial killer career when a potential victim escapes and this time gets some police to take him marginally serious. Once the Polaroids are discovered and Dahmer cuffed, the situation just starts to get worse and worse. There's the head in the freezer, the various skulls and assorted bones, as well as preserved body parts. Oh, and the 55-gallon barrel of acid. It's a gruesome scene that's revisited throughout the series. For the initial horrifying loadout, the series uses the actual news footage of the literal piles of evidence that were hauled out. The two men moving the vat were only 18 at the time, though that's not exactly a good age to be when carrying a barrel of acid and dissolved human. Then again, is there a good age? Serial killers are partially defined by their need for trophies or memento from their conquests, but Dahmer seemed to be overdoing it. Why was he doing that? Well, he had a plan. He was going to build himself an altar to himself. It would involve 12 skulls and two complete skeletons. Between the seven skulls he had and the four complete heads, he was up to 11. When asked, he said that the purpose of the altar was to make him feel more at home. After almost being caught so many times, he might have thought that he was invulnerable at that point. Before Dahmer's caught, the world is paying attention to its normal, everyday problems. The series opens with Cleveland watching the news that reports about a black undercover officer who was beaten by five white police officers. Nothing like that happened in Milwaukee, but a similar event happened a year later in Tennessee. Another news report later in the series reports about a fire in Stafford, a place that doesn't exist, and the closing of the Alice Chalmer factory plant, which in reality had shut down in 1985. During Dahmer's first trial, after assaulting the elder Synthesymphone, during the sentencing, the Synthesymphones were allowed to give statements to the court. However, the father struggles with English, and to highlight the disparities that allowed Dahmer to avoid notice for so long. The judge interrupts the father and asks one of his children to translate for him. This runs in contrast to the affection he shows towards Dahmer, vowing not to ruin his life over this one incident, sentencing him to one year in a correctional facility with a work pass. The real situation was actually much worse. The synthesis phones were not present because they had not been told sentencing would be happening that day. If you think about it, we are all living in the true crime-shared universe. Serial killers tend to know of, or sometimes even admire, other serial killers, but these are all real-life people, so they exist off the screen as well. True crime is the most immersive shared universe going.